You're not going to tell me that uh, when you claim you a Christian, it, it doesn't matter how you look or how you act. What's wrong with you? Tyler Perry's supposed to be a Christian. If that man is a Christian, he can't be a cross-dresser at the same time. At the same time. You know how the entertainment biz can be, right? Total jungle, airing everyone's dirty laundry like it's nobody's business. Some folks say the music scene takes the cake for being the wildest, maybe because of its shady history or whatever. But hey, the movie world isn't exactly sitting back either. And guess who's stirring up drama now? None other than Monique. She's out here ready to spill all the tea about Tyler Perry. Word on the street is she's got some serious dirt to dish about why Tyler Perry might just outdo Diddy when it comes to scandals. Like, we all know the wild stories about Diddy, right? But if someone's throwing shade and saying Tyler Perry might be even worse, that's next level crazy. If you're itching to know the juicy details and how Tyler Perry manages to top Diddy, buckle up, because this is going to be a wild ride. So a few months back, Monique hit up the Apollo Theater and straight up went off on Tyler Perry, Lee Daniels, and Oprah Winfrey, accusing them of all sorts, you name it. This Oscar-winning actress wasn't holding back, especially about her rocky relationships with Perry, Daniels, and Winfrey. You remember Monique, right? She was in that heavy-hitting film Precious back in 2010. But since then, she's only popped up in four flicks, and she's pointing fingers at being blackballed. Back in 2015, she first let it all out, saying this trio, Daniels, Perry, and Winfrey, put the kibosh on her career. Daniels, though, fired back, saying Monique's demands during Precious didn't exactly vibe with the Hollywood scene, souring things up. But Monique wasn't done spilling the tea. At her Apollo gig, she straight up said, blackballed isn't the right term. If you don't know what that means, here's Monique explaining it to you, albeit a few later down the stretch when it happened to her once again. She said, Yeah, I'm actually, Lee Daniels and I had a conversation and he offered me the role of Cookie. And we went back and forth with his company and our company trying to get TV quotes and all. And then we got a call, I got a call back from him because I hadn't heard where I was supposed to go and do the screen test. And that's when he said, Mama, you've been blackballed. And I said, well, why have I been blackballed? And he said, because you didn't play the game. And I said, what game is that? And he was never able to answer that question. So that's as clear as I can be, because I've been saying the same thing repeatedly. Yeah. So I hope that answers your question, baby. Let's rewind to 2009, when Monique was gearing up for a press tour for the movie Precious, co-produced by Oprah and Tyler Perry. They were all hyped about her Oscar nomination buzz, but here's the twist. They weren't planning to pay her for the tour, and she was already wiped out from filming. So Monique made the call to skip the tour and chill with her fam for a bit. Seemed pretty straightforward, right? And everyone was cool with it. But then, fast forward a few weeks, and wham, media stories start cropping up, painting Monique as difficult to work with. Suddenly, nobody wanted to cast her, despite her bagging an Oscar for her role in Precious. Imagine watching all your hard work go down the drain like that. Monique started connecting the dots, realizing someone was out to get her. In a recent chat with interviewers, she spilled the beans that Precious director Lee Daniels straight up admitted she got blackballed for not playing the game. Monique even called out Oprah and Tyler Perry, asking for an apology that's still nowhere to be found. All right, let's rewind a bit to a few months after that whole press tour. Debacle. Monique decided to spill the tea about Oprah inviting her brother Gerald and her parents to her show. Now here's the backstory. Monique's brother did some awful things to her when she was just a kid, and she'd been open about it in an interview back in 2008. So, Monique confided in Oprah about her strained relationship with her parents because of this, and Oprah seemed understanding. Monique was okay with Oprah inviting Gerald, but didn't want any part of it herself. But when it came time for the taping, Monique was caught off guard seeing commercials featuring her family. Oprah had basically gone back on her word, pretending to be all caring. Monique demanded an apology, but Oprah offered nothing. No private, no public apology, Nada. And to this day, Monique's still waiting for that apology. Now, the fact that Oprah and Tyler Perry are tight doesn't help matters. Some people think Monique's just stirring up drama, but others are fully backing her, believing Perry and co owe her an apology. Clearly, Monique's got some serious beef with Tyler and she's not holding back. Rumor has it she's ready to spill all his secrets. And honestly, considering she's been in the industry for ages, it's not surprising she might have some insider info. Now, Tyler Perry's no stranger to the limelight. He made waves in the Atlanta theater scene and struck gold with his media series. But let's keep it real. His journey hasn't been smooth sailing. Word is his ego might have gotten a bit out of control, leading to clashes even with heavyweights like Oprah. Hey, in Hollywood, sometimes you gotta play a few questionable cards to make it big, right? and Tyler Perry seems to know the drill. So after crushing it at the box office, Tyler Perry shifted gears to TV with the mega popular sitcom House of Pain. But things took a messy turn when it came to locking down a sweet syndication deal and a spinoff called Meet the Browns. 
According to a source, Perry gave the boot to four writers who were asking for union contracts, stirring up some serious drama in the industry. It felt like a slap in the face, said writer Terry Brown Jackson to Deadline. We busted our butts to create over 100 episodes, but when it's time to reap the rewards of syndication and spinoffs, he decides to cut us loose unless we accept a lousy offer. Kelly Griffin, the head writer for House of Pain, wasn't backing down without a fight. While I hope something good comes out of this for us, if this fight helps future black writers get what they deserve, then that's a win she said. But what was Perry's response? He claimed he's doing all the writing himself now, but his union issues didn't stop there. In 2015, actor union SAG-AFTRA and Actors' Equity went all out, banning their members from Perry's play, Medea on the Run, because his production company refused to sign those union contracts? Looks like Perry's profit game isn't earning him cheers from everyone in the business. Some straight guys are speaking out, saying Tyler Perry's pushing them into some weird stuff, and it's messing with their work. So here's a story time about how filming Meet the Browns was the most stressful and hardest thing that I've ever done in my entire life. I had no idea that Tyler Perry studio schedule was so drastic. If you're working on a regular network show, they take a whole week to film an episode. Tyler Perry Studios, they film an episode in one day. The character was Jeffrey, a fat high school teenager who was very intellectual, who was getting bullied at school. I take two to three days to learn the entire script. On the day of filming, first thing we do is a table read. I know all of my lines, I'm ready to go. So the director who is Alfonso Ribeiro Carlton in The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, he starts to block us, telling the actors where to go, where to stand. Mr. Perry comes in, everything changes. So we literally run the entire episode for him and he hates it. Does that mean I have to learn a whole new script? Yes, that's what it means. Mr. Perry on the spot starts rewriting the entire script and he's feeding me the lines to say and the director is kind of standing on the side like you better do it because if not they will fire you. Here is where the shoe hit the fan. So in the middle of Mr. Perry changing up the scenes he says you know I want Jeffrey to be gay and he has a crush on his bully. That's not what I auditioned for. What? So actor and voice coach Brandon J spilled all the tea on TikTok sharing that shooting just one episode of Perry's Meet the Browns was the toughest gig he's ever had. According to Jay, a day on Perry's set feels like a whole week's worth of shooting elsewhere. And if that's not enough, he says Perry's infamous for dropping last-minute script changes on the actors, making them memorize lines on the spot. Jay, who auditioned for the role of Jeffrey, spilled it all. So get this, the actor caught on to Perry not feeling the original script, which meant everyone had to scramble to learn new lines, all chosen by Perry himself. According to Jay, Perry went full-on impromptu, rewriting the entire script right there on the spot and feeding lines to the actors. And here's the kicker. If you didn't catch on quick, Perry would drop the you're fired bomb. But wait, there's more. As Jay hustles to nail those new lines, Perry decides out of the blue that Jay's character is going to be crushing on his high school bully. Yep, definitely not what Jay signed up for at his audition. Perry drops the bomb like, I want Jeffrey to be gay and have a crush on his bully. Crazy, right? In the second part of the saga, Jay spills that his first reaction was to hit up his agent, who basically said, you you don't have to take this if you're not cool with it. But after some serious pondering, Jay decided it was a chance he didn't want to miss out on. So despite Perry throwing in a last minute twist and making the character gay, Jay went ahead and played the role. Rumors have been floating for a while, suggesting that Tyler Perry might be projecting his own suppressed feelings onto black male actors. But hold on to your hats, cause things just got even juicier with recent buzz about Tyler possibly exploiting younger black men in the industry. Christian Keyes stirred up the pot even more with a tearful video on Instagram, spilling about abuse of power in the industry. He shared his own painful experience with a powerful man who allegedly boasted about having multiple young black men on his payroll. I've been speaking to my brother about making a declaration of my experience. Um, what I experienced with certain powers that be that were moving inappropriately. And I really, like it's in my bone marrow to discuss that because thankfully God built me the way that he built me, but I, I'm not sure, you know, based on this person's claims and, and brags um, that he's literally got, at the same time this person was Sexually, sexually harassing me for years.
Christian didn't drop any names, but you can bet the internet's gone into overdrive trying to connect the dots. Here's the twist. Christian's been in cahoots with Tyler Perry for almost two decades, from Diary of a Mad Black Woman in 2005 to the recent TV series All the Queen's Men. Naturally, folks are wondering if Tyler Perry's the mysterious figure in Christian's story, but let's keep it real. These are all just speculations, and only Christian Keys knows for sure who that powerful man is. He mentioned gathering evidence, secretly recording some stuff, and handing it over to the police. So, in a few days or weeks, the mystery might unravel. But regardless of Christian's situation, Tyler Perry faced other accusations, like abruptly firing writers, casting stereotypical characters, and perpetuating harmful stereotypes about black women. After House of Pain and Meet the Browns hit it big, cultural critic Jamila Lemieux even penned an open letter to Tyler Perry, telling him straight up she wasn't vibing with how he used stereotypes in his work. The man has a huge audience, and he's Tyler's very smart. You know what he's done. He started out you know, with these plays and church buses would pull up, packed, and he's parlayed it into a, you know, bought his own jet. You know, you can buy a jet, you got money. But at the same time, for me, just imagery is, is, is troubling. Guess who decided to join the critique party? None other than film director Spike Lee. And he didn't hold back when it came to calling out Tyler Perry for those stereotypical characters. According to Spike, the industry could seriously step up its game by ditching those one-dimensional characters in Perry's record-breaking but, in his opinion, biased and nonsensical movies. Tyler Perry's casting choices and how he portrays characters are raising eyebrows and sparking talks about his whole business approach. Some folks are saying Perry tends to slot dark-skinned actors into villain roles while making white characters the heroes in his films. Even Chris Rock threw in his two cents, pointing out a pattern in Perry's movies. Rock noticed there's a glaring lack of kind and respectful black-skinned boyfriends in Perry's films. To drive his point home, he brought up Tupac Shakur, suggesting Perry's films could use a bit more variety in character representation. Chris Rock's got some thoughts on how things role in the Tyler Perry movie world. He's saying Tupac, you know, the rap legend, might not exactly land a hero role if he scored a spot in a Tyler Perry flick. According to Rock, based on Perry's usual casting moves, the chances of Tupac being cast as a hero would be pretty slim. Rock's just sharing his two cents on the whole deal. And guess what? Spike Lee's totally on the same page. They're both pointing out that Perry's casting and storytelling choices might be playing a part in why some of his movies are so successful, thanks to some biases. They're both questioning how this mindset could be messing with the film industry. But you know what's crazy? This whole colorism thing isn't new to Hollywood. Lately, Hollywood's been getting called out left and right. Remember Harvey Weinstein? Yeah, he was one of the first big shots to drag the industry into the negative spotlight with abuse allegations back in 2017. And now, there's even a new documentary spilling all the tea on the dark side of Hollywood, exposing power players allegedly preying on aspiring actors. Fast forward to the Hash Me Too movement, and Hollywood's been hit with scandals left and right. Kevin Hart even stepped down as the Oscars host in 2019, over some past homophobic tweets. Plus, the Oscar So White campaigns calling for more diversity and recognition for people of color and marginalized communities. The Hollywood Walk of Fame ain't exactly glittering. It's more like a stroll of shame without those stars. Let's take it back to the 40s when Hattie McDaniel snagged that Oscar for Gone with the Wind. Historic win, right? She was the first African American to grab that prestigious award. But despite the victory, the Oscars back then were basically a whites only affair, and McDaniel found herself sidelined from the celebrations. Talk about a bummer. Fast forward 80 years, and Hollywood's still grappling with discrimination. Even with all the talk about boosting diversity, the 2020 Oscars weren't immune to racial controversies we've all gotten pretty used to. And don't even get me started on the major snubs, like leaving out Lupita Nyong'o for her killer performance in Us. Now let's talk about Tyler Perry's movies and shows. No denying it, dark-skinned actors often get cast as the villains in his flicks. Take Steve Harris in Diary of a Mad Black Woman, for example. He's playing Charles McCarter, a successful lawyer who turns out to be a total jerk to his wife. And then there's Blair Underwood, spilling some tea about his early career and the struggles black actors faced in Hollywood. And speaking of roles, a bunch of actors got their shot at playing villains in Tyler's movies. From Philip Edward Van Leer, to Ion Overman, to Ron Rico Lee, they've all rocked some not-so-nice characters. And if you've been tuning in, you've probably noticed a trend. Lots of those characters are seriously abusive towards women. It's got people talking, for sure. Tyler Perry's movies always stir up discussions, especially on Twitter and other social platforms. Some folks call him out for showing the struggles of black 
black women dealing with men's actions in his films, while others say he's just shedding light on real-life issues. Either way, Perry's storytelling definitely gets people talking about some pretty important stuff. Critics aren't cutting Tyler Perry any slack, despite his big contributions to the black community. They're like, hold up, let's talk about the slip-ups. They're pointing fingers at moments in his movies and shows where black women get a raw deal or face some seriously unpleasant stuff. Some folks are saying Perry's work kind of pushes this idea that his characters can only find happiness and success by sticking to some strict respectability politics. And then there's this concern that he's holding on to a ton of creative control, maybe ignoring other talented black and brown female writers and directors out there. Take his adaptation of For Colored Girls Who Have Considered Suicide When the Rainbow Is Enough, for example. The critics are basically saying, hey Tyler, we want to see more nuanced and responsible portrayals in your work. Let's talk about that comedic style though. It's funny as heck, no doubt, but some folks think there's more to it. Dave Chappelle even spilled some tea about how he got asked to rock a dress in a movie alongside Martin Lawrence. He wasn't feeling it at all, but the producers kept pushing him, saying all the greats did it and got rewarded. Dave wasn't vibing with that though. It's not about wearing a dress itself, but he felt like the industry was trying to corner black artists into doing whatever it took for success. And he's not alone. Lots of other black men have been asked to do the same thing. Now Tyler Perry's not just a big deal in entertainment. He's got major influence, even in right-wing evangelical circles. His media empire is no joke, and it's got folks talking. But here's the thing. Kevin Hart, for example, was all about protecting his brand and not crossing any boundaries. He even proudly declared he'd never do something he didn't want to do just for money. But then, and there he is, popping up on SNL rocking a dress. Kind of makes you wonder, right? Wow. Wow, wow, wow. I, I don't think anyone saw this one coming. Kavenjane Wallace, of course, the first African American, the first female, and first child pope. And, and what is the new pope doing? Uh, pope Kavenjane is lifting her arms into her signature muscle man pose. Mm, truly adorable and everyone loves it. Well, except for presumed frontrunner Cardinal Turkson, who does not look happy. <laughs> but it looks like Pope Convencione is doing the Dougie. Speaking of Diddy, he managed to land himself in another legal pickle. I mean, this guy's no stranger to lawsuits, right? Seems like every other day there's some new headline about him duking it out in court. And this time, it's with his ex-business buddy Charlie C throwing down the gauntlet. Charlie's not playing around, accusing Diddy of some heavy stuff like straight-up theft and breaking contracts. And get this, he's aiming for a cool $10 million out of Diddy's pocket, all because of this trademark drama over Act Bad. Apparently, Diddy dropped a song with City Girls called Act Bad, but Charlie's saying, hold up, that's my trademark. Mark. You can't just go around using it without my say-so. Charlie slapped Diddy with a lawsuit in New York, claiming Diddy used the Act Bad trademark without getting the green light first. He's gunning for $10 million in damages. Now, on the trademark front, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office confirmed that Kenyatta Jr. did file for Act Bad back in November 2021, and it's legit. But the one for Act Bad Entertainment is still pending. By the way, this trademark covers stuff like beanies and sweatshirts. Charlie's beef is that Diddy supposedly ripped off his Act Bad trademark for some merch that dropped in 2023 alongside a song of the same name. And get this, he's claiming Diddy's legal team ignored his emails about it. According to Charlie, there was supposed to be a deal involving profits from the song, the music video, and the merch. But he says he didn't sign because he was behind bars and someone else's name was on the contract. Plus, he wasn't feeling the term. Now Charlie's out of the slammer and he's taking to Instagram to air his grievances. He's not holding back, claiming he got screwed over because of his situation and he's coming for what's rightfully his. But here's the kicker, this isn't even even the first lawsuit Diddy's faced in recent times. Nope, not even close. This is like, what, the fifth or sixth lawsuit in less than three months? It's getting downright crazy. Remember Cassie's bombshell lawsuit? That was a total game changer. She laid it all out, alleging abuse, manipulation, you name it. And then more women came forward with their own allegations. It's like one lawsuit leads to another, and it just keeps snowballing. But hey, Diddy's not taking it lying down. He's coming out swinging, denying all the allegations, calling them frivolous. He's swearing up and down that he's innocent, and he's ready to fight two the nail to clear his name. Still, you gotta wonder, is this just the tip of the iceberg? I mean, where there's smoke, there's usually fire, right? With all these lawsuits piling up, it's like Diddy's got a bullseye on his back. Who knows what else might come out of the woodwork next? It's like a legal soap opera, and we're all just sitting back with our popcorn, waiting to see how it plays out. So, what's the secret sauce behind Perry's success? There are all sorts of theories floating around, but given all this info about him, do you think Tyler Perry might be headed for some rough times? And hey, can you spot any similarities between him and Diddy? It's definitely something to think about.